On this Sunday night, Russia's revenge. A brutal assault to end 2023. This is our new year. The Kremlin makes good on its vow of vengeance after a deadly attack it blames on Kyiv. The hidden job market. A majority of roles are never posted online. After a year of downsizing, what could be the key for laid off workers? Plus, will Trump triumph in 2024? How the former president is holding on to a huge lead in the Republican race. And a royal bombshell. The shocking announcement from the Queen of Denmark. Global National with Farah Nasser. Reporting tonight, Sophie Louie. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with an escalation of the violence in the war in Ukraine. Moscow following through on its pledge to avenge civilian deaths inside Russia, launching a series of airstrikes on the northeast region of Kharkiv. The assaults retaliation for Saturday's attack on the Russian city of Belgorod, which Russia says killed two dozen people, including children. As Redmond Shannon reports, the ongoing conflict has seen increasing intensity in the final days of 2023. Irina Nikitina picks up what's left of the festive season. What a present the Russians made for us this new year. They are black souls to bomb residential areas. Elsewhere in Kharkiv, a huge hole in the side of a modern hotel. Somehow, no one was killed, but authorities say 28 people across Kharkiv were injured. Another strike hit a nursery and completely destroyed it. The residential buildings surrounding it were hit by the wave of the explosion. Russia claims its strikes killed Ukrainian security officials. The overnight drone attacks, which mostly focused on Ukraine's second largest city, were not a surprise. The Kremlin had promised revenge after a wave of airstrikes on the Russian border city of Belgorod on Saturday. The regional governor there said 24 people were killed, including three children. This resident said it's difficult to know what to say after the death of children. Ukraine rarely admits to attacks inside Russia. Security sources in Kyiv reportedly blamed falling fragments from Russian air defense missiles for the civilian deaths. These attacks on both sides follow Friday's deadly airstrikes across Ukraine's major cities, which killed at least 41 people. Among the more than 10,000 civilians, the UN says have been killed in Ukraine since Russia's 2022 invasion. In his New Year's Eve message, President Volodymyr Zelensky praised troops fighting for Ukraine. It's estimated tens of thousands of soldiers have died on each side since February 2022. One of the latest 38-year-old Vasil Medvichuk from western Ukraine. His relative says she prays her two-year-old son, Vasil's godson, will not grow up in a Ukraine where he is asked to fight and die. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. The U.S. says it destroyed three boats carrying Houthi rebels from Yemen in the Red Sea today. The U.S. Army says a Navy helicopter sank the vessels after being fired upon while it was responding to a distress call from a container ship owned by shipping giant Maersk. The rebel group says 10 of its members were killed or are missing as a result of the incident. Houthi forces have been targeting ships in the Red Sea since November, claiming their attacks are in response to the war in Gaza which saw another heavy day of bombing. Footage released by the Palestine Red Crescent Society shows rescuers saving an injured boy from under the rubble after the enclave was bombarded today. The Hamas-run health authority says Israeli strikes have killed dozens in the last 24 hours, largely in central and southern Gaza. The Israeli military released video claiming to show its forces in Khan Yunis, Gaza's second largest city, as it vows to push farther south and take control of Gaza's border with Egypt. Here at home, the new year means a search for new work for many Canadians. 2023 was a time of fewer job postings and increased layoffs compared to the post-pandemic boom. That has many feeling anxious about their employment prospects. But as Anne Gaviola reports, there may be some hidden tools available for those who find themselves looking in 2024.
We went from help wanted everywhere and remote jobs galore to return to the office mandates and pink slips. 2023 was a very interesting year because the pendulum absolutely swung. There were over 250,000 people laid off in the tech industry alone. Regardless of whether you're gainfully employed or suddenly not, many feel job security has vanished. It can happen to anyone. This career strategist knows from her experience in 2017. A bunch of us were let go. The role was eliminated. Her advice? Don't blame yourself for what happened and set yourself up for your next role. Employers are looking at what you've done in that break, upgrading the skills, talking and networking, volunteering, giving back. The pendulum may have swung in favor of employers, so competition may be stiff, but that doesn't mean there aren't opportunities. A survey by business consulting firm Robert Half suggests many hiring managers plan to add new permanent positions in the first half of 2024, as well as hire for vacant positions. There are still hundreds of thousands of jobs and you only need one good job. Career strategist Toby Oluwole suggests developing your personal brand. He frequently shares insight on LinkedIn and says it's opened avenues he never dreamed of. My content on LinkedIn has been seen over 140 million times and because of that I've been offered roles that I could honestly not even apply for from VP of sales to director of sales. An estimated 80% of roles hired in Canada are part of the hidden job market. The key to finding your next job or upgrading to a better role? Well, it's all about who you know. A majority of roles are never posted online. They are found through networks. Anne Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. The Queen of Denmark has unexpectedly announced her abdication. Margrethe II revealed her decision during a live televised New Year's address. She said she had been contemplating leaving her role since undergoing back surgery in February. The 83-year-old has reigned for nearly 52 years and is currently Europe's longest-serving monarch. Queen Margrethe will formally give up her title on January 14th. She'll be succeeded by her eldest son, Crown Prince Frederick. The U.S. is just weeks away from the first primaries of its 2024 presidential election. And the question gripping voters is whether anyone can stop Donald Trump from becoming the Republican nominee. A twice impeached, defeated former president facing multiple criminal trials wouldn't seem to be much of a contender on paper. Yet, as Jackson Prosco reports, Trump is far ahead of his rivals. It's a race haunted by the ghosts of campaigns past. We're going to very simply make America great again. Donald Trump sounds a lot like the man who won in 2016 and lost in 2020. Only this time around, he faces multiple criminal trials and the real prospect of conviction. Our enemies want to take away my freedom because I will never let them take away your freedom. Any other candidate in his position might be considered too damaged to press on. Hello, everybody. Donald Trump is surging in the Republican race, polling at 59% support. His next closest rivals, Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley, barely crack the double digits. As long as Donald Trump is drawing breath, he will be in the race. Uh, the thing is, will people think that he can't beat Joe Biden? That's the one thing that will break Republicans off. Chaos follows him. You know I'm right. Nikki Haley, once Trump's U.N. ambassador, argues her old boss would be bad news for the country. And we can't have a country in disarray and a world on fire and go through four more years of chaos. We won't survive it. Others have struggled to find a message that will break through with Republicans. I think it's going to take somebody whose best days in life are still ahead to see a country whose best days are ahead of itself. TV tough guy talk may sound good to some people. It never happens. Trump keeps standing strong. Even the man once considered his chief competition, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, is wary of criticizing the frontrunner's fitness to serve. Look, father time is undefeated. I don't know how he would score on a, on a test, but I know this. We have an opportunity to nominate someone and elect someone for two terms who's going to be spitting nails on day one. Trump's enduring appeal is rooted in a cult of personality. 
Supporters still believe his lies about the 2020 election. We will never give up. They embrace his baseless claims that the multiple criminal cases against him are actually a political witch hunt. Every time the radical left Democrats, Marxists, communists, and fascists indict me, I consider it a great badge of honor. Mostly, Republicans seem to love Trump's desire for revenge against his perceived enemies, from Democrats to the media to fellow Republicans. You would never abuse power as retribution against anybody. Except for day one. Trump is so confident in his standing that he has skipped every single Republican debate. It hasn't hurt him a bit. He owes it to you to be on this stage and explain why he should get another chance. Behind the scenes, there are quiet signs of discontent. The influential Koch network, backed by conservative billionaires, is putting its bets on Nikki Haley. This signals to a number of people that she is really viable, she is the true alternative. That hasn't moved her standing in the polls. As Republicans prepare to caucus in Iowa and vote in the New Hampshire primary in January, it would take a political miracle to close the gap with Trump. He is his party's favorite, and nothing seems likely to change that. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. Well, from affordability to foreign interference. Coming up, the political stories that dominated 2023 and what our Ottawa team is watching for in 2024. It's been a busy year on Parliament Hill. Joining me to unpack the year in politics are global national reporters Abigail Beeman and Mackenzie Gray and our chief political correspondent David Aiken. It is tough to pick a story this year. I was looking back and realizing all these things happened this year that felt like maybe, I don't know, they were 10 years ago. Uh, but everything from wildfires this summer, uh, the political fortunes of the Liberal Party, the war in the Middle East, every year is busy, always unpredictable. But this one, there were so many competing top stories. Abigail, I know you really had your finger on the pulse, perhaps even more so uh, with Canadians this year than in the past because you were off on mat leaves. You were talking to real people, normal people, not who we talk to here on Parliament Hill. What's your top story for this year? It, it's affordability, no question. I mean, as you say, I was on mat leave. There was a, a, an opportunity to observe things from the viewer perspective and also, you know, be in the grocery store in the middle of the day talking to Canadians. Uh, and cost of living, whether that is cost of groceries or cost of housing or people not having money to go out like they maybe used to do. Vacations are a different conversation. The interest rates, all of that rolled together is what was top of mind for everyone that I spoke to and, and what I felt resonated as, as the biggest story of the year. Uh, and something that also stood out to me was how the Conservatives were able to make that their number one issue and have people pay attention to that all year long, uh, where the Liberals still sometimes seem out of touch with the average person's concerns on affordability. So through that all, we saw the Conservatives rise in the polls. We saw Pierre Polyev's you know, actual physical makeover trying to connect with people. And Canadians that I spoke to seem to say that it's working. Yeah, really interesting the way that affordability connected to both the federal government and the federal opposition. It's obviously a complex issue, Mac, but it really it really stuck. Does that relate as well to the top story that you see? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there were a lot of the time that the Liberals wanted to talk about housing, but they were focused in on the China issue, which took up the bulk of the first part of the year. It wasn't just foreign interference here on Parliament Hill. I got the first-hand opportunity to go out on HMCS Montreal, warship through the Taiwan Strait. We started in Singapore, on there for two weeks, and we got to see Chinese interference when it comes to the military firsthand. We were traveling with an American ship that was cut off by a Chinese warship, and we saw similar things like that throughout the year. We've seen uh, warplanes buzzing Canadian warplanes, and you go back to January, you think about the spy balloon that was coming across, too. So <laughs> That's really, right. That was this year, too. I China was heavily involved in our <laughs> politics, not only when it comes to Parliament Hill, but the military as well. And, and Mercedes, you and I were back here when, when Matt could not have been more excited trying to get a signal from the ship <laughs> to tell us this news, yeah. he, this news that made, uh, made headlines around the world was with the, the film that, that we caught. And it wasn't just China, of course. The other big foreign interference story was India. In fact, India was accused of helping to kill a Canadian on our soil. And the Prime Minister said so in the House of Commons, blew up relations with India. But by the end of the year, uh, India seems a little more contrite because the Americans are now in saying India was trying to do the same thing to a Canadian citizen in New York City. So India and China, the two foreign interference 
and, bad guys, if you will. And so. we heard about Iran, too, starting to really Iran. pick up towards the end of the year. Concerns for Erwin Kotler's life related mm -hmm. to Iran, concerns for Iranian activists' lives. Uh, we, we've had affordability, we've had international politics. David Aiken, I know you. There's always provincial elections. politics and it's elections. There's always elections. Your, yeah, and <laughs> listen, stories. we had a really significant uh, outcome in one election. Manitoba, the first time a First Nations person is the premier of a Canadian province, and that's Wab Canoe, of course. So I think, regardless of the political stripe there, I think that is worth taking note. Uh, premier Canoe knows he's the first First Nations premier, but as he said during the campaign and afterwards, he's trying to uh, be the premier for all Manitobans. And the other election, of course, too, is that we had was in Alberta, where Daniel Smith won, can you say, a small majority? I mean, it's still a majority, uh, but it's a small majority. And I think that's significant because. Uh, Smith is most emblematic of premiers, and there's more and more of them who want to pick on Ottawa. That's, that's their political hay, is picking on Ottawa. And to the extent the Trudeau government needs to make hay on housing, they need the provinces desperately to participate in that housing. And if the provinces aren't going to get along with the Trudeau government, that's a big problem for the government. And that, and that picking on Ottawa really did work. You go back to February, there's a health care deal. Justin Trudeau did not want to give a bunch more money to the provinces when it comes to health care. And on the carbon tax, too, Atlantic premiers pushed the Liberal Provincial Caucus, yep. the Liberal Caucus out there, to get the Prime Minister to change that on the carbon tax. I think we'll see that coming next I, I think we're going to get to that in just a minute, but don't get ahead of yourselves, because right after the break, we are coming back for what is in store with 2024 with our panel, who, as you can see, are very very excited to talk about that. We'll have the top issues on our radar for the year ahead. With me again now to discuss what political stories we're keeping an eye on for the new year are global national reporters Abigail Beeman and Mackenzie Gray and our chief political correspondent David Aiken. I love this because it's the crystal ball. I always feel like part of our review panel should that we come back and we evaluate your answers <laughs> yeah. on this. Which is easy for well, me. Well, last year we one. said there would be no federal election in the year just finished, that and we right. were correct. Yeah, that was right. Yes, but which that leads was an easy me call. To the question of is is that on your list? Is a federal election in the cards, Abigail, or do you have something else? I think I'm going to go with something else. I think I'm not going to wait into that <laughs> prediction for a few reasons. But I, I stick with affordability. You know, top story for me this year for sure. And I think that all of these questions and concerns that Canadians have are not disappearing. You know, January 1st and the, in the new year and especially not when those um, credit card bills from holiday shopping start to roll in. Uh, so that you know, that's the question. Uh, are the interest rates going to come down? Uh, we see the heads of grocery chains uh, in front of committees. Are we going to see any difference in the grocery stores? Or reports suggest that, that food prices are, are only going to go up. Housing. The Liberals spending so much time and energy trying to tackle the housing crisis. When will we start to see that make a difference? Uh, I think that's not a problem that's going to go away overnight and I think all of those issues together uh, make affordability the number one story as the uh, year 2024 rolls out. Mac, what do you think is coming down the pipe? Well, I don't think there's going to be an election, Mercedes, probably because the NDP and the Liberal Supply and Confidence Agreement is going to be able to stick. You look at the polls right now, Pierre Polyev is well far ahead. So if you're the NDP sitting there thinking, how can I get more out of things? How can I deliver my agenda? It makes a lot more sense for them politically, where the polls are right now, to stick with the Liberals, try and extract more from them than, say, force an election and have Pierre Polyev get a majority government, which is where it looks like it would be right now. So I would expect things like Pharmacare, which looks like it's going to be a little bit delayed, to actually get done and move forward in that Liberal NDP deal doesn't make sense for them right now to pull the plug. But Mac, I'm curious to know what effect do you think that has on the Liberals in the next election? Because well, you can stay in power because you have the agreement. If they continue to trend the way they are, is it an opportunity to turn things around or is it a danger? Well, I've talked to senior Liberals about this, Mercedes, and they are very confident to have the next election be on which party is more progressive. Is it us or is it the NDP? You know, one interesting thing we have been <laughs> seeing recently is that the NDP is actually at the government announcements. We saw Don Davies, the health critic, talking about the dental care program, you don't see that very often. So there's some cooperation right there. It'll be interesting to see how Canadians respond to two parties really working together in a fashion we haven't seen in modern Canadian politics. And interesting to see if the question that voters are going to vote on is who's more progressive and whether that is what they're looking for. David, what's your perspective on what's coming for us in 2024? Yeah, that's, I mean, the, the pool of Canadian voters, 60% of them, broadly speaking, would be more on the progressive side. So that's interesting. Listen, I'm sorry to be such a uh, dull boy here, but provinces again, that's for all the electoral <laughs> Fun's going to be. Listen, we had two elections last year. We got BC going to the
the polls again. David Eby, NDP, in the lead there. But look for a redrawing of the opposition map. The BC United are behind this thing called the BC Conservatives. So a redrawing of the electoral map. In Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan Party Premier Scott Moe going to the polls, likely to win again. But watch for the NDP under Carla Beck to improve their standings. And I am already getting um, attack ad emails from the PCs in New Brunswick, where there's going to be one. And these ads are vote against Justin Trudeau's carbon tax by voting for the provincial PCs. And this is the common denominator in every provincial election I've seen for the last two years. The country's most popular politician is Justin Trudeau, and every conservative-leaning party, Scott Moe, uh, the B.C. conservatives, Blaine Higgs in New Brunswick, they want to put Justin Trudeau on the provincial ballot to knock out the progressive vote and hopefully campaign to a win. Heather Stephenson and the PCs in Manitoba tried that by putting Trudeau on the ballot with Canoe. Didn't work. But nonetheless, the other thing, too, is we're here in eastern Canada. If you're in western Canada, you know this. The alternative to any small-c conservative party is a new Democrat. The liberals are non-existent. As a provincial party in western Canada, non-existent federally except in B.C. And in Winnipeg, that's about it. Maybe northern Saskatchewan a bit. But nonetheless, the point is, federally, the NDP want to do what NDP parties in the West have done. Sorry, I have to put a nickel in the jar. But you get my point is, that is a realignment of, is it conservative or what? It used to be conservative or liberal. ND, the NDP in many parts of this country is saying, no, 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 we're the natural alternative to what used to be liberal parties. And that's a shift. Well, we'll see where it goes. And of course, there'll be all those stories we can't predict, which pop up on the international front as well and affect Canada and require a response, including things like that inquiry into foreign interference. And, and what other country uh, perhaps will be added to the list by that point, if any more? Thank you very much to all three of you for joining us with your thoughts on the stories ahead. I know you'll all be on top of them and covering them, and we'll be keeping a close eye. We'll see you in 2024. Next, welcoming 2024, the dazzling displays where the new year has already begun. A brilliant fireworks display in Auckland, where New Zealanders were among the first in the world to ring in 2024. That is Global National for this Sunday night. I'm Sophie Louie. From all of us at Global, we wish you a very happy new year. We leave you tonight with more dazzling New Year's celebrations around the world. Thanks for watching. Carolyn Jarvis will be at the anchor desk tomorrow. Have a great night.